in our explorations of different Sufi orders, we have primarily so far stayed in the East, the Naqshbandi and Ni'matullahi orders both being from the Central Asian region. Now, today we're going to turn our gaze to North Africa to explore one of the most influential Sufi orders in history, the Shadri order. The Shaviliya, as it's also known, is the most widespread order in North Africa both today and for most of history, and it has also attracted a lot of people from Europe and North America in the last century. It's a Sufi order that is often known as one that adheres very strictly to Islamic law, and that seems to attract people in particular of very high intellectual status or scholars, basically. Why is this? Are these claims even true? And what is the history and development of the Shadli order, as well as the role that it plays in the world today? The story about the origins of the Shadriya is essentially also the story about the beginnings of Tariqa Sufism in the Maghrib, which is western North Africa. Tariqa is the Arabic word for path, which refers to an order in the Sufi tradition. And these orders started to develop first in the 12th and 13th centuries, primarily in the central Islamic regions like modern Iraq and Syria. At this time, the earliest orders of Sufism, like the Qadriya, the Rifaiya, and the Suhravardiya, had already started to develop in these central regions. In North Africa, this more institutionalized form of Sufism hadn't really entered the picture yet. There were so-called ribats, or convents of sorts, to which certain Sufis would be connected, but these did not constitute a formal path or organized practice in the same way that the Eastern Tariqas did. The word Tariqa wasn't used in the context of the Maghrib, which includes countries like Morocco, Algeria and Tunisia, or in Al-Andalus, southern Spain. Instead, the few organized forms of renunciant practices, or Sufism broadly defined, were called ta'ifa, meaning something like a fellowship or community. The early ta'ifas, however, were often connected to Berber tribal identity, membership essentially was only allowed to and revolved around being part of a specific tribe, and not common practice in the way of the Eastern orders. Sufism in the Maghrib and Al-Andalus revolved more around individual renunciants and mystics and their saintly authority. North African Sufism as such had very unique characteristics that differed them somewhat from the Sufism in the lands of the East. Some of the literature associated with the Baghdad Sufis, such as works by Al-Muhasibi, Nuri, and others, had of course penetrated into the western regions and influenced various renunciants here, but by and large Maghribi and Andalusian Sufism developed on a trajectory of its own, with its own unique practices, ideas, and modes of authority. This authority was not only based on things like deep mystical insight and experiences, but a huge emphasis was put on altruism, so the Sufi saint's ability to love his neighbor, to give to the poor and to act selflessly, give to those who are in need and being a caring person, often to the detriment of themselves. And there's perhaps no better example of this in the early period than the figure Abu Labbas as Sabti, who is considered the sort of patron saint of Marrakesh. While in Eastern Sufism, more emphasis was put on psychology, so the inner states and stations of the Sufi path, which would be traversed by the practitioner, in the Western context, while this isn't completely absent of course, authority and emphasis was more put on outer expressions of this piety, like the aforementioned altruism and charity among other things. We also see in Al-Andalus and the Maghrib a more philosophically or theoretically oriented mysticism, concerned with metaphysical speculation and theories, which was represented by figures like Ibn Masarra, Ibn Barajan, and which would culminate later with figures like Ibn Arabi and Ibn Sabain. 
Indeed, it is in the 12th century that Sufism really starts to gain some steam in the Maghreb and in which we find some of the most foundational figures like Ali ibn Hirsihim of Fez, uh, the very charismatic wandering Berber mystic Abu Yaza, and the ecstatic and controversial Abu Abdullah al daqaq as well as their collective student and perhaps the most significant Sufi personality at this time, Abu Madian. These are all important characters in our story today as they provide the background and context for our narrative, but they are not our main characters. The Shadali order is based on the life and teachings of another Sufi saint, Abul Hassan al-Shadali. He was born in northern Morocco at the end of the 12th century and is, together with his predecessor Abu Madian, largely responsible for bringing together the native Sufi traditions in the Maghrib with the established forms of Sufism in the East, represented by figures like Al-Ghazali. The order that was founded based on him would also be the first time that the Sufi order in the international institutionalized sense firmly entered the western lands of the Islamic world. The life of Ash-Shadali is, as is almost always the case, difficult to tell with certainty, as we are working with a number of different hagiographical material that sometimes even contradict each other. He was an Arab in terms of ethnicity and even a Sharif, a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad, which already was a sign of great authority in this region at the time. It seems that early in his life he uh, studied in Fez, which was the kind of intellectual and religious spiritual capital of Morocco at this time. The biographical accounts tell us that he was a kind of spiritual seeker who was looking for a Sufi master to study under, and it is for this reason that it seems that in 1223 he traveled traveled eastward to Egypt and possibly Iraq to find this master to whom he could become a student. Here he met a master of the Rifa'i Sufi order called Abul Fat al-Wasiti and briefly became his disciple. However, this sheikh told Ash-Shadali that he was to travel back to the Maghrib to find his true spiritual guide there. So once back in his home region, Ash-Shadali went looking for this master. And finally, in a small hermitage on top of a mountain in Morocco called Jabal al-Alam, he found him in the person of Abdus Salam ibn Mashish, a charismatic and ascetical hermit. Ibn Mashish would be the most important figure in Ash-Shadili's life and the one that opened the doors to spiritual awakening for him, as it were. Also known locally as Moulay Abdus Salam, he is considered a kind of patron saint for all of Morocco to this day. After having been initiated by his new master, Ash-Shadili then settled for a while in what is today Tunisia, in a village close to Tunis called Shadila, which is where he eventually got his name. He became quite a popular preacher and Sufi personality here and attracted a large group of followers, but also aroused the suspicion of the local Al-Muhad authorities. He was accused, as is often the case, of being a Shiite agitator, among other things, and after a while decided to travel east again. Primarily, he went on the Hajj, or pilgrimage, to Mecca, and then settled eventually in Alexandria, in Egypt. Here, he continued to be very popular, was supported by the authorities, and amassed an increasing group of disciples. He would perform the pilgrimage once every year for the rest of his life, but it was on one of these pilgrimages in 1258 that he passed away in the Egyptian village of Humaythara, where he was buried and his shrine still stands today. Ashadali was a prolific and charismatic teacher, but he didn't really produce anything in terms of written material for us to study. There is a very popular prayer that is attributed to him that is known as the Hisb al-Bahr, or the Litany of the Sea, but not much other than this at all. His authority basically rested entirely on his charisma and his skill as a teacher and spiritual guide, and it was up to his successors to formulate those teachings into a proper Sufi order. His first successor as leader for the community was Abu Abbas al-Mursi, who had accompanied the master from Tunis to Egypt. But probably the most significant was the second successor, Ibn Ta'allah al-Askandari. He was a native of Alexandria who had become attracted to the teachings of Ash-Shadali through Al-Mursi and is probably most responsible for turning the Shadaliyya into a proper Sufi tariqa. 
Unlike al and Al-Mursi, Ibn Atta'illah was a prolific writer and scholar. He firstly wrote a biography of Abu al-Hassan al-Shavili in which he places him within a more eastern paradigm of spiritual authority, names him the Qutb, the spiritual pole of the age, and thus lay the groundwork for what would become one of the most widespread Sufi orders in the world. Perhaps most famously he composed the Kitab al-Hikam, the Book of Wisdoms, which is a book of short, beautiful aphorisms that has become immensely popular and influential in the Shavili order and beyond. Ibn Atta'illah is also a kind of defender of Sufi practices and ideas against its enemies. Most notably, he engaged in debates with the renowned scholar and critic Ibn Taymiyyah. You could say that the Shadaliyah developed in two different directions at this point. One led by Ibn Atta'illah, with its base in Egypt and Alexandria, which eventually became the dominant, but also another kind of branch in western North Africa in the Maghreb, which accepted another uh, succession of leaders after Abu Abbas al-Mursi. There could be differences in practice and things like this between the two groups, but you could argue that eventually over the centuries the two kind of merged to the point that the Shadaliya as a sort of as a single order became the dominant Sufi tariqa in all of North Africa. Even to the point that many established Sufi movements at the time, like the school of the Sufi philosopher Ibn Sabain and his student Ashushtari, became essentially absorbed into the Shadali order. Important for the development of the order into dominance in the region are also later developments and further branches of the order, particularly the teachings and movement of Muhammad al-Jazuli, a Shadali master whose branch is often called the Shadaliya Jazuliya, or simply Jazuliya, and which created a form of Sufism that was heavily involved in the politics of the region and the development of Sharifism the idea that political and religious authority was primarily the privileged right of the descendants of the Prophet Muhammad, which has heavily shaped Morocco to this day. al jazuli wrote the very popular prayer book called Dala'il al-Khayrat, which is specifically dedicated to prayers and supplications for the Prophet Muhammad. Indeed, Jazuli and his followers would place an enormous emphasis on the role of the Prophet and his role in the spiritual quest, even more so than other Sufi movements, which is really saying something. According to Jamal Abu Nasr, the Dala'il quote, made veneration of the Prophet the core of Sufi piety. The Jazuli movement became so popular that it solidified the Shadali order as the most dominant in the Maghrib and reshaped the region's entire spiritual and religious landscape. The heavy emphasis on venerating the Prophet Muhammad would become an important feature of Moroccan Sufism in particular, and later referred to as the Tariqa Muhammadiyya. If you read Sufi poetry from this region from the last few hundred years, there is an unusually strong focus on praising the Prophet, and this also explains the connection with the political ideas of Sharifism. In general, the particular teachings and practices of the Shadaliyah are difficult to talk about because just like other orders like the Qadriya, the Shadalis have never had a single head of authority and neither did the early leaders of the community establish any particular rules or way of doing things. We can play it safe by saying that the Shadali order practiced the most universal Sufi ritual known as dhikr, or remembrance, where names of God or the Muslim proclamation of faith is repeated for long periods of time. One will often have regular gatherings called hadra in which practices like these are performed, and as with all other orders, the Shadalis have their own vird or prayers and prayer cycles that are given to initiates by their sheikh and which are recited either privately and in or in group. Ibn Atta'illah, in fact, did write a treatise dedicated to dhikr in particular called Miftah al-Falah, the key to salvation, in which he defends the practice as well as its vocal performance in particular. So that is the vocal chanting of dhikr that is perhaps the most common in Sufism, where people would sit in groups and will, will, they will chant vocally, sometimes pretty loudly, the names of God or the proclamation of faith. Some. Uh, other Muslims and even Sufi Muslims were against this idea of doing it vocally, uh, but most weren't, and Ibn Atta'illah writes this treatise uh, where he, among other things, defends this uh, vocal practice of dhikr. So we know that the Shadalis, even in the early periods, did perform dhikr and that they did so vocally. 
but other than these basic practices, there is really not much that characterizes the Chadalia in particular. And because it has spread so widely across North Africa as well as the rest of the world, we see a lot of variety and, and diversity between regions and branches of the order. So it's difficult to say something in particular uh, that characterizes the order in general. Just as in many other Sufi traditions, the Shadalis view as important the visiting or ziyara to the shrine of a Shadali where he is buried, which is in Humaythara, Egypt, as I mentioned. And they will often gather there annually, usually on his birthday or Maulid, going to this one village in, in Egypt, and they will do dhikr or vocal chanting together, sometimes sing uh, with percussion instruments, they will uh, pray together and other rituals related to the Shadali practices. The Shadali order is often described as a sober Sufi order. What this means is that they usually don't take part in more ecstatic practices, such as the elaborate sama rituals or music rituals of other orders like the Mevleviya, for example, with the very famous whirling dervishes. Related to this, it is also claimed that the Shadaliya is a Sufi order that adheres very strictly to Islamic law. Now, I would be very careful about claims like this because basically all Sufi orders very strictly follow Islamic law, at least as they understand it. But this means that just like all other Muslims, the Shadalis pray five times a day, they do the Hajj to Mecca, they give to charity and all the other obligations that other Muslims follow, aside from their supererogatory and additional prayers and practices that they do as part of the Sufi way, so to say. I think what is usually meant with this following Islamic law strictly thing is the previous point about the order being more sober, quote unquote, which is a accurate enough claim, I guess. I think it might also have something to do with the fact that, as I said earlier, there isn't a law that characterizes the, the Shadaliya in particular, like many other Sufi orders, for example. If we talk about the Mevlevi order, like if you ask me to describe the Mevlevi order, there are like clear characteristics, like, oh, the whirling dervishes, the elaborate sama rituals. Uh, if you ask me to describe the, sh the Chishtiya order, oh, it's the, the Qawali music and the Sama practice there, okay. If you ask me to, to talk about the Rifaya order, well, they have the very elaborate sort of rituals involving swords. And like, and when we talk about the Shadali order, it's like, they're Muslims. Like, there isn't anything that stands out in the same way about the Shadaliya in comparison to many other orders around the world. I think that's why some may feel that the Shadali order is more in, in line with Islamic law. They seem more like regular Muslims. And all of this is very problematic, of course. But uh, if I had to guess, I think it has something to do with that, too. But like I said, because of the lack of any distinct rules within the order and its widespread, there is huge diversity within the Shadali order. Some branches are very politically and socially active, others are more quietist. Some branches practice sama or ritualized listening to music, others don't, and so on. Over the centuries, the Shadaliya has developed several sub-branches, all with characteristic features and practices of their own. One of the most significant of these branches has been the Shadaliya Darqawiya, founded by the Moroccan Muhammad al-Arabi al-Darqawi. This branch is sometimes characterized by a doctrinal adherence to the school of the Andalusian master Ibn Arabi and his ideas of the unity of being, as can be seen from the writings of Darqawi masters like Ahmed ibn Ajiba. But it has also become probably the most widespread globally and attracted many Westerners in particular. One figure from the Darqawi lineage that has become especially formative in this later regard is the Algerian Ahmed al-Alawi, on which there is an amazing book called A Sufi Saint of the 20th Century by the author Martin Lings. Indeed, as many Westerners started to become interested in Sufism and Islam around the turn of the 20th century, it was often to the Shadali order in particular that they turned. The Swedish painter Ivan Ageli is probably the first of these converts. He had a special fascination with the teachings of Ibn Arabi and joined the Shadali order while living in Egypt. Ageli was the person who in turn initiated the famous René Guénon, and here we see the start of the so-called traditionalist school, or the school of perennial philosophy. 
This is a movement that has emerged in the last century that emphasizes a perennial wisdom that hides within all of the world's quote-unquote true religions, often with the view that Sufi-oriented Islam is the most complete expression of this perennial wisdom. The representatives of this school are often followers of Ahmad al-Alawi in particular, who kind of created a branch of his own within the Shadaliya Darqawiyya, which is often called the Shadaliya Alawiyya. Now these branches and super branches often get very complicated and complex, but stay with me here. In any case, this perennial school, often associated with the Shadali order in particular, has been represented by figures like the already mentioned René Guénon, Fritjof Schuon, Martin Lynx, and the current most prominent teacher and philosopher, Syed Hossein Nasser. This group of scholars have also been instrumental in bringing the work of many Sufi scholars of history to a Western audience, such as many translations and interpretations of figures like Ibn Arabi and Mullah Sadra, and they do shape our understanding of these figures to a massive degree. But not all prominent Shadali figures in the West are connected to the traditionalist school or the Alawiya. The American Islamic scholar Noah Hamim Keller is also an adherent of the Shadali Darqawi order and is often considered one of the most important Muslim teachers in the world today through his many publications and commitment to online education. We should also mention the recently passed American Sufi Sheikh Nuruddin Durki, may he rest in peace, who further spread the order to the US and very interestingly also has connections to other contemporary figures like Ram Dass, and was actually largely responsible in his youth for the publication of his very popular work called Be Here Now. It is because of the popularity of the Shadaliya among scholars and Western converts of high intellectual status that the Shadali order has become famous as an order that in particular seems to attract people of very high education or intellectual prominence or whatever you want to call it. Um, it's hard to say why this is or if this is even accurate to begin with, but it might have something to do with the so-called sober approach of the order as well as the flexibility that it has because it has become so widespread and that it doesn't have any particularly fixed rules and so on. Um, that's one guess as to why it has attracted so many from the West. More so, perhaps, I would argue that it has something to do with the historical circumstances in which this order was accessible to the figures of the early 20th century. So as you can tell, the Shadaliya is a Sufi order that has not only managed to survive almost 900 years, but has also spread to places all across the world. The community started by Abul Hassan al-Shavli in the 13th century has become a decisive factor in the history of North African Sufism. Through his incorporation of local Maghribi slash Andalusian Sufi traditions with the Tariqa based Sufism of the East and the later firm establishment of his authority into an institutionalized Tariqa by successors like Ibn Ta'Allah, the Shadali order brought a slightly new kind of Islamic mysticism to the Western lands of the Islamic world. As Shadali stands together with Abu Madian as perhaps the most important figures in the Western Sufi tradition, and the order that was founded based on him came to dominate this region for the rest of history. Later developments in the order further shaped the political and religious landscape of the Maghreb, and lately has also come to shape the religious landscape of Europe and North America. So, the Shadali order is not only one of the oldest surviving Sufi orders in history, it is also absolutely one of the most important. I'll see you next time. I would like to express my deepest gratitude to all of my patrons who keep this channel going through their support. And as always, a special shout out to all of my new saints, including Nicholas Kano, Prophet's Apprentice, Woden Born, and Abbas Akbar. Thank you all so much.